evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight uh, with School Fight Podcast. Really important, really, um, you know, strong topic tonight. So um, we're going to get into it. But my name is Rachel. I'm a school psychologist working in the state of Maryland. And I'm going to pass it over to Rebecca, who's going to tell you a little bit about how to participate tonight. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Rebecca. I'm a school psychologist working in the state of Connecticut. And the easiest way for you all to participate, if you're watching us live, is to log into your YouTube account. And right around along the side of the video screen, you'll see um, a, a place for a, a conversa an ongoing chat a conversation. So just log in, and you can um, put your questions, thoughts, and ideas right there. And also, um, if you're watching later on YouTube, and you can we can continue the conversation on either Facebook page, Facebook um, School Psych, your school psychologist, or the School Psych podcast page, and also on Twitter using the hashtag Psyched Podcast. And if you're watching live and you happen to prefer to comment uh, privately in messages on Facebook or Twitter, please do that. I'll be looking for not notifications, and I'll be happy to share your thoughts and questions to our wonderful guests. And now here's Eric. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Eric, and I'm also a school psychologist practicing in the state of Connecticut. And uh, I'm excited for our guests this evening. Uh, last spring, Rebecca and I had the privilege of meeting Dr. Reeves at a conference through the Connecticut Association of School Psychologists. And uh, we both were very excited about what she spoke to us about and uh, thrilled with the idea that she might participate in the podcast. So we're excited to have her this evening. Uh, before we do a formal introduction, I'd like to share a little bit of information about the poll. So we had a poll on Facebook to discuss uh, our training needs and thoughts and ideas about risk assessment, threat assessment, and those kinds of procedures. So uh, people chimed in. We had 56 people say that they felt they needed more training and support to feel comfortable with risk and assessment procedures. And that was our highest response. So a uh, pretty significant amount of us, I think, would uh, benefit from tonight's discussion at the very least. Um, 29 people said they've participated in PREPARE training. Uh, 24 people said that their district has a comprehensive school safety plan. 21 people responded that they're part of a crisis intervention team or crisis prevention team. 10 people said they feel comfortable with risk assessment procedures. Seven people said that they feel well-versed in the state's anti-bullying laws. Five people responded that uh, their district has a, a crisis prevention team, but as a school psychologist, they're not part of it. Uh, four people responded that their district has a safety plan that is not yet comprehensive. Um, and then we had fewer than three response, three or fewer responses for uh, I'm a leader in my school's crisis prevention team or my school provided crisis training from another provider. Um, so certainly crucial um, information I think we're gonna discuss this evening and uh, the impact that it will have on us as practitioners and our impact on our districts I think will be very important. Um, so I'd like to introduce our guest this evening. Uh, Dr. Melissa Reeves uh, is a nationally associated school psychologist, uh, nationally certified school psychologist, has a PhD. She's also a licensed professional counselor and an associate professor at Winthrop University. She's past president of NASP of uh, 2016 to 17, and um, has also been a special education teacher, is a licensed special education teacher. She has over 19 years experience working in public schools, private schools, and daycare and residential treatment programs. And Dr. Reeves is co-author of the Prepare Crisis Prevention and Intervention Curriculum and travels both nationally and internationally training professionals in crisis prevention and intervention, threat and suicide assessment, trauma, PTSD, and cognitive behavioral interventions. Uh, she recently joined Sigma Threat Management Associates as a senior consultant and is also an advisor for Safe and Sound Schools, an organization founded by two parents who lost their children in the Sandy Hook tra tragedy here in Connecticut. She has co-authored multiple books and publications focusing on school safety and trauma. So welcome, Dr. Reeves. Thank and, you. Uh, take it away. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well Thank you for having me this evening. Um, clearly, this is a topic that is uh, not only near and dear to my heart, but also school psychologists across the country um, are just really embracing the fact that um, 
you know, we, we need to be more engaged in this field and really use the leadership skills and the skill sets that we have as school psychologists to make a difference in regards to safety prevention all the way through recovery. So what I'm actually going to be doing this evening is um, I'm going to go with, with the PowerPoint so that way everyone can kind of follow along because I probably am presenting about five days of workshops in like one hour if that gives you any, any ideas as to um, what we're going to be doing tonight. And um, so and what I'm going to actually be doing is using the prepare curriculum as the framework. But then what I will be doing is stopping periodically and asking questions that people have, and then we'll save some time at the end. So um, clearly one of the most important things that we need to do around school safety is being prepared in advance because everybody on some level is going to experience some sort of a crisis event, whether it be um, a smaller scale event of the expected death of a student or staff member due to a long-term illness versus a car accident, a bus accident, suicides, and obviously some of the large scale um, natural disasters and school shootings that unfortunately we have been experiencing lately. So, um, so what I'm gonna present to you is information that really can expand and contract based upon of um, the variety of situations that we often face in schools. So I do wanna put a little caveat here that a lot of what I'm gonna be sharing with you is obviously I'm using the prepare curriculum as the framework, but it does not replace um, a full training training and prepare, and I'll talk more about training opportunities at the end for people who are interested. Um, so obviously talking about why schools need this training, I, you know, I'm talking to the choir here about the fact that we experience crises, um, you know, on a regular basis, some, you know, um, a smaller scale than others, as I mentioned. But one of the real important things for schools is that we're a very unique setting. And so we have anything from pre-K all the way up through 12th grade. We have students with developmental disabilities. We have students with physical disabilities. We have mo um, very diverse student and parent populations. Um, some may not speak English. And so how do we communicate? So one of the reasons that PREPARE was developed as a school crisis prevention and intervention training curriculum specifically for schools is to address a lot of these unique circumstances that other settings like community settings and so forth um, may not have as eclectic of a population as we have per se. In addition, the developmental considerations that we have to take into consideration is real critical uh, because what we do with a 16 or 17 year old is not appropriate to be doing with a kindergartner. So, so this model also really interfaces with a lot of the different age groups um, that we work with. Uh, also, we now have language in um, ESSA that actually really focuses on school safety in addition to providing some funding, although it's very small print, that can actually be used for this kind of work, um, trauma-informed care, mental health first aid. So they actually wove in some legislative language that allows some of those funds to be used for this kind of work. And what I'm really going to be um, really focusing on is also the importance of physical and psychological safety uh, and how we have to have both. So when we look at, for those of you that may not be as familiar with the PREPARE curriculum is that again, it is you know research and evidence-based, um, developed by expert school psychologists in consultation with safety experts, flexible for a variety of the different educational settings that we work in, and addresses both the physical safety needs and the psychological safety needs that I will be talking about in a little bit. And what we really emphasize is, you know, the importance of the multidisciplinary team approach that we as school psychologists or an administrator or an SRO, we can't do all of this by ourselves. Um, it really does take a team of people. So when we look at the sample current policy and law, um, how do we get people's attention to do this kind of work with um, when there's such competing demands for resources? A lot of it really does have to do with, um, quite honestly, it's legislation. And um, we have some legislation like an ESSA that talks about the importance of this work and being able to use those funds. We now have 33 states that actually require comprehensive school safety plans where it's specifically mentioned. Um, thank goodness now we finally have all 50 states that have some sort of bullying legislation. The challenge, though, that we face with the legislative initiatives, though, is that um, they can be very vague. 
So how states and districts interpret this legislation varies tremendously. Um, and the depth for which people have put their plans together really varies tremendously. I mean, I've seen things as simple as just one page and they're like, well, this is our crisis plan. And I'm like, that is not at all sufficient. Um, so the legislation obviously drives a lot of these initiatives. And as we saw um, after the Parkland incident, um, lots more states have been passing legislation, but at the same time, it often doesn't come with the resources needed to really fund appropriately some of the legislation that's being passed. So we have to be real creative in how we utilize our resources and really work together. Um, this is a really important document. If you have not been exposed to this yet, um, it's free, it's downloadable, just Google the title of it. And it was put out by the US Department of Education and really provides a guide for how to develop emergency operations plans and they talk about the five mission areas. And so notice it goes from prevention all the way through recovery. So if you have a school crisis plan that only talks about what to do in an active shooter situation, that is insufficient. That is not at all a high quality emergency operations plan or many schools just refer to it as a crisis plan. It really does start with our prevention programming and goes all the way through recovery and meeting the mental health needs. This particular document also addresses um, the incident command system, basically how we need to structure our crisis teams. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, but we really need to have a structure in place that interfaces with other first responders. So that way when they show up on scene and they say, who's your incident commander, we know what they're talking about. Um, otherwise, what we have found in schools is if we don't know what we're doing and we don't have a good structure in place, other people come in and take over. And sometimes their approach and the practices that they use are not at all appropriate for our settings or the developmental age groups that we work with. Um, in addition, what you see here is we have to be ready to respond on a variety of different levels. Um, from a minimal response, which may only take just one or two people that spend an hour with a student who maybe is grieving the loss of um, someone that they really loved, and we stabilize them, they're able to move back to class, it may only take one or two persons. There then are those incidences that require more of a building level response to where re really your whole team needs to be activated. And if there's mental health needs that need to be addressed, all of your mental health folks, um, it's kind of all hands on deck. Then there's those events at the district level where you have district level personnel who may need to come in and support the team. And then there's the regional level response, for example, um, natural disasters where the needs are really beyond what a school can provide. And therefore we need to really have those collaborative relationships established in advance. The important thing with the levels of response is that there's harm in both under and over responding. So we need to do a really good job of psychological triage, which I'll, which I'll talk more about in a little bit, to make sure that we are responding appropriately and that we are not interjecting harm by overreacting or the fact that we, you know, there's uh, mental health needs that go unmet because we underreacted. Um, so it really is being ready to have all these different levels of responses. In addition, notice I said that like the district and the regional level team come in to support the school level team. Prepare really strongly emphasizes that each school should have a crisis team that is trained and ready to go because you know your kids the best. You know your teachers the best, you know your families the best. Teams should never come in and replace a school team. And unfortunately, when we don't have the right um, systems in place and we don't have trained personnel to do this work, that's what ends up happening. And that's where we've actually seen harm interjected um, or needs go unmet. So when we take a look, I mentioned the incident command system and we talk more about this in prepare workshop one, but this is a structure similar to what other first responders use. And notice that it is hierarchical and there is a clear chain of command which helps facilitate communication. Um, the incident commander is typically the person that's overseeing the, um, the crisis response, whereas you have other individuals then assigned to really do the duties needed to make sure that students and staff are physically and psychologically safe. Something that the, the 
Um, the federal government, though, did not add in this model. If you look at this arrow, it's called the mental health officer. Um, we added that within the prepare curriculum because we need to make sure that the mental health needs are being met, not only of the students and staff and the families, but also of um, the crisis team members who are responding. And that's where the importance of care for the caregiver comes in. And then this model is designed to expand and contract also based upon um, demonstrated need. So when we talk about just kind of the conceptual framework of prepare, um, you know, we're really focusing on, you, it begins with prevention and preparedness. The best thing we can do is be ready for an event um, by doing really good jobs of preparing and having teams and plans in place. But even better is to try to prevent these incidences from happening in the first place. But we, but re reality is there's no way we can 100% prevent um, from our school or students ever, you know, experiencing some sort of a crisis event. So when an event happens, the first thing we need to do is reaffirm physical health and perceptions of safety and security. And this is real important. You just think of Maslow's hierarchy. Then we want to evaluate the level of psychological trauma risk. So um, we are moving away from the one size fits all approach of open up an auditorium or open up a cafeteria and send everybody down. There's a lot of harm done in that. First of all, um, you end up with students that some just honestly want to get out of class. And so they're not there because they really need help. You run the risk of contagion. And then you also run the risk of vicarious traumatization when you're putting some kids in a room that are really impacted with kids that are not all that impacted. By the time they see those reactions or they're hearing some of the other kids' stories, you now may have secondary trauma victims through vicarious traumatization. So I'll talk more about how we're moving to a multi-tiered approach in a little bit and moving away from the big room and sending everybody down. Um, and then we always have to examine what we've done. I don't know of any school that is perfectly ready for an event to take place. And I don't know of any crisis response that's ever gone absolutely perfect. So we're always refining um, our plans and what we've done and learning from, from you know, prior incidences to be better prepared for future incidences. So in regard specifically to prepare for those that might be interested in pursuing some additional professional development, um, workshop one is, uh, it's a, basically a full day workshop where we focus on the prevention and the preparedness piece and really focusing on comprehensive school safety and the development of um, safety teams and crisis teams and safety plans and crisis plans. And then workshop two is a two day workshop that focuses on the multi-tiered crisis interventions that you do when an event takes place. And that really focuses on skill building. So it's two days because we do role plays, we do vignettes, and you walk away with having a multi-tiered approach to crisis intervention and actually knowing how to deliver um, a variety of different types of crisis interventions based upon need and based upon level of impact. Um, and as you can also see, you know, in workshop one, where we focus primarily on the P for prevent and prepare, we really do hone in a lot on physical safety. So absolutely, we need to make sure that we don't have unwanted people getting into the building. We need to make sure that teachers can lock their classroom doors. We need to be ready to move kids to a safe place as, as quickly as we possibly can. That's where drills and exercises come in. That stuff's all important. School resource officers kind of fit under physical safety to some extent, but that in and of itself is insufficient. Um, it doesn't matter how many metal detectors you have or how many doors are locked. If, if you have a school that does not have a positive school climate, if you have a school where students are being bullied, where they don't feel accepted, where we're not meeting the academic and emotional needs, they don't feel safe coming to school, there's a lot of underground kind of behaviors going on, teachers maybe don't have the skill sets to deal with some of these behaviors, that leads to a student not feeling psychologically safe. And so that piece of it is just as important as physical safety. The two have to go hand in hand. You need structurally, you need a safe school, but also emotionally and psychologically, you need a safe school. So we really focus in workshop one, how to build both physical and psychological safety. And then we focus on how to put together safety teams and plans, crisis teams and plans. And then we also talk about um, media. We talk about the importance of communication, of reunification planning, 
how to meet the needs of students with physical um, disabilities and those that um, you know have developmental disabilities or on the autism spectrum. So it's a real meaty workshop that really gets you taking a look at what do you have in place that's working. Because as we say, don't feel like you have to start from scratch. If you've got some things that are working well, go for it. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, we need, there's always things that need to be refined and enhanced. So workshop one really focuses on that. This is the other piece that really goes with the um, overall school climate that addresses psychological safety. What some schools are not aware of is that back in 2010, there was um, a dear colleague letter that was sent to every superintendent in the country that basically said, if you have an incident that falls under OCR guidelines, it is no longer enough just to consequence the perpetrator. They're going to be looking at what was the climate and culture like of the school? And was there a hostile environment that allowed this kind of harassment and bullying to go on in the first place? So we're really emphasizing this within you know, the work that we're doing, because this goes back to all of those positive behavior support frameworks that are out there and multi-tiered systems of support is you know we need to be addressing the overall school climate and culture. It's not just about how we deal with individual behaviors and that piece of it's real important. Um, this is also another key piece that we often see here is um, the issues of foreseeability and negligence. This is oftentimes what gets administrators attention is um, the bottom line is um, there are some states, particularly the state of Colorado, where there's been some legislation passed that have lessened government immunity for school districts. So we are now being held to a much, much higher standard when it comes to crisis prevention and preparedness and threat and suicide assessments. And basically what legal cases, particularly those under tort claims have said, is that if the school had any foreseeability that there was potential harm to self or harm to others, whether it be a student reporting it directly, rather seeing a post on social media, rather a parent leaving a voicemail message or sending an email, staff members overhearing a conversation in a hallway, any of those things can be considered foreseeability. Once we know about it, even if we only have vague information, we now are responsible for acting upon that and doing what we need to do in order to ensure both physical and psychological safety. If we don't go do a good job on that, then that is where negligence comes into play and where parents can file lawsuits based upon tort claims for a school's basically negligence um, in, in ensuring um, not only a physically, but also a psychologically safe school. Um, and you know, if you mentioned that, if you look down here at the last one where it talks about a school professional can be sued for failing to protect students. There was one court case that was filed to where a school mental health professional chose not to implement the suicide prevent or the suicide assessment protocol that the district had put in place. Um, and so the family actually went after that individual school mental health professional because the district had done their due diligence in providing training and a structure and a protocol but that individual chose not to follow that protocol. So, um, so there's, you know, case law, um, you know, continues to come out and we learn from it, um, but the foreseeability and the negligence is really the huge piece. And when we talk about threat and suicide assessments, I have still have some individuals and leaders in school districts say, well, but if we don't put a process in place, then then we can't be accused or held responsible for doing it wrong. And I'm like, that is such faulty thinking. The expectations now through multiple reports that have been produced after crisis events, um, for example, the Sandy Hook reports that came out were very, very clear that schools need to have threat assessment teams in place. And we all know too, the importance of having suicide risk assessment teams in place and school districts need to be trained in this process. And what we also know is by having a good process in place, um, number one, our students are our best eyes and ears. So we have to train the students to break the code of silence and to come forward and have adults trained in how to appropriately 
look into the level of concern and then put an intervention of supervision and a monitoring plan in place for these students that we have identified that are really struggling and need help. What we know is there's very clear data out there that says when we do these assessments well, we actually can prevent an act of violence from happening and we can actually help prevent a student from going on to attempt suicide. So it's um, real clear the importance of having this kind of training and these teams in place and school districts um, and school professionals feeling comfortable doing these. Um, and without having these things in place now, a school and a district is really putting itself out there for potential litigation if there is an act of violence towards self or others that would take place and they don't have these protocols in place. Um, and then, you know, just to kind of wrap up a little bit more about, you know, what we talk about um, in workshop one is also the importance of reaffirming physical health and perceptions of safety and security. And the bottom line is when any event happens, think about Maslow's hierarchy, we need to get students to a safe place, um, both physically and psychologically, before we can even begin our mental health work. And so it's real important that we have practiced lockdown drills, um, evacuation drills, shelter in place, because by having those in place and staff knowing what to do and executing them in a as calm of a manner as possible, what that does is it gives that sense of controllability, even though we may not fully have control over this event, by just knowing what to do and how to get yourself to a safe place, it allows for some sense of controllability to be brought in, which leads to a better sense of safety and security, which then um, mitigates traumatic impact. So this is really an important protective factor um, for trauma exposure, is having plans in place um, that everybody knows what to do and to get students to a safe place. Um, so I wanna pause here for just a second and see if there's any questions um, over anything that I've covered so far in regards to kind of the bigger picture of school safety. And then I will next get into more of the specific mental health response skill set. Great. I have a, a thought as we're um, looking to the internet to see if we have any viewer questions. Um, Dr. Reeves, can you talk a little bit about, you were just saying how, you know, how, practicing the plans and the lockdown, the lock-ins and all the drills are um, helpful because people feel like secure that the people in charge know what to do. And, and um, so that mitigates um, their their fear and um, so on. But I, in my experience, I find those moments, not only for the, the students, of course, some kids at first, um, depending on how um, how it's talked about, the drills and on all have anxiety or worry or concern about, about the drills. But, but the adults sometimes too, I hear, I overhear them saying things like, it's not going to help us to be sitting in the corner or, you know, you know, sort of questioning the practicality of the lockdown drill and um, thinking about events in the news. And it just sometimes feels like the, the drills themselves um, create a culture of fear and anxiety in, in this building. Right. That is an excellent question, especially around active shooter drills are a huge um, discussion topic these days. And to how do we prepare, prepare for those kinds of situations in a way that we're not interjecting harm? Mm -hmm. um, and so we do need to make sure that our drills and our exercises are developmentally appropriate. And they do not need to be highly sensorial in order for us to be ready for certain events. So as I say, we don't light a fire in the hallway to practice fire drills. We do not need to necessarily bring in a highly simulated active shooter to where someone has a fake gun and is shooting off fake blanks in order to be ready for those kinds of situations. However, I know that there is a lot of debate out there because there is this theory that if you if you don't have that kind of highly sensorial experience and you're, you're gonna freeze up, that's not necessarily going to be the case. Um, if you have 
trained them in how to successfully execute a locked a lockdown and get behind a locked door. That is still by far the most number one safest thing that we can do because at least in regards to armed assailants, what they're looking for is easy opportunities. Um, and there's only one case that we're aware of of where the door was um, actually breached in most all of the other cases, um, they when they they tried the door handles and they were locked, they moved on. Um, now, I will say, if they happen to breach a locked door, then yes, you need to train students on, so what do you do? How do you distract in order to get out of the room as much as possible? But it doesn't mean you teach kids to fight intruders. Um, and I, I, to be honest with you, I personally hate the, the run, hide, fight wording because I think people misconstrued fight to mean that we teach students and staff members how to take on an intruder. And what it really means is, how do you distract in a way to try to get yourself out of that situation? Um, and I could go on about this particular topic, but NASP and the National Association of School Resource Officers has actually developed a great document called Best Practice Considerations in Armed Assailant um, Drills. So it's best practice considerations in armed assailant drills. Just Google that, or you can go to the NASP website, which is www.nasponline.org, and look under resources and go into the school safety section. And on the left side, you will see a link to that document. And that talks about how to responsibly do these kinds of drills and exercises in a developmentally appropriate way, and also some of the important considerations that school districts need to consider before they do more of the highly sensorial drills. There have actually been a couple lawsuits filed um, from school personnel who were forced to participate in active shooter drills that were highly sensorial and they were actually traumatized or physically injured. So um, districts need to proceed carefully with more of the highly sensorial. Um, but that document provides some really good guidance. Um, but I think it's with anything that we train, you know, um, it's Im important that we do it in a way that um, prepares and educates, but without unnecessarily traumatizing and scaring them. We don't need to unnecessarily use scare tactics with our population, so. Thank you, that's helpful. Yeah. And I mean, that was actually, I was thinking of that same question too. So I was glad that um, Rebecca jumped in because you see too in the news, um, you know, I saw a news clip where they were interviewing a student following a shooting and, and her take was, well, we knew it would happen eventually, you know, cause they see it so much in the media and they, they, you know, I, I feel like there's this level of anxiety in our schools now. Um, and it's sad. So I do think that that's super important that we're careful that when we are practicing things, it's, you know, in this calm manner, like you said, um, and then I had kind of a follow-up right. question. Um, I read an article, um, it was about uh, suicide risk assessment and looking at, um, I think the title was, and I, I can pull it up maybe in a second, but something about suicide risk assessment causing more harm than good um, because, you know, some really? of those probing <laughs> questions maybe. Um, is, is, that, is there any truth to that or is that just people being a little bit uncomfortable asking questions or? Yeah, um, I have not seen that particular article, but I would love to have you forward that to me. Um, here's what we do know. Opening up the conversation does not cause somebody to then go on and attempt suicide. By not opening up the conversation, they're at higher risk for actually carrying out an attempt. So we need to open the conversation and we need to be there to support. Now, I would be curious how, like with this study, what protocol was being used and how was the risk assessment being done? Because there is a skill set to doing it the right way for which the student sees you there as a non-biased, non-judgmental helping adult that is there to help them get the help that is needed. Um, if you, you know, approach it in kind of this drilling fashion where you're just firing off questions, or, you know, come on, would you really do something like this? You know you have a family that loves you. And kind of approaching it more from what could come across as a shameful approach, then yeah, that's not gonna be very helpful to a student. So, um, but what it's very clear and it's been, um, and that is such a myth out there 
that if you talk about it, they're more apt to do it. No, if you don't talk about it, they're more apt to do it. We have to open up the conversation and give them permission, not only to come forward for help, but also give them permission that if you see a friend, please come report, please come get them help. Yeah, I'm looking at the article. I, I saw it originally. I think Rebecca actually shared it out on her Facebook page. It was from Scientific American and it referenced a, a meta-analysis um, by Matthew Large. So I posted that link if anyone's curious. But I, I mean, in reading it, it was interesting, but um, I wasn't sure if, yeah, it was more driven by kind of fear of asking those questions than of legitimate research. But I'm definitely going to check it yeah. out. <laughs> All right. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Any other questions before I move on to more of the psychological um, intervention piece? All right. Well, we'll have time for more questions at the end. Um, and then real briefly, you know, I just want to overview um, what I'm going to cover next. We do mostly in prepare workshop two, where we're actually building skill sets for mental health professionals to be able to respond to students in um, that have been exposed to a traumatic situation or who have had a loss. And so one of the most important things we have to do is we have to evaluate. We don't just jump in and start providing blanket interventions without first evaluating what has been the level of impact. So in order to do this evaluation, you know, we are looking at a combination of different variables. You know, was this event predictable? Were there fatalities versus injuries? We know fatalities tend to lead to higher levels of traumatic impact. Um, the duration of the event, the longer that you're exposed to the traumatic situation, obviously you, um, the higher the potential for traumatic um, impact. The intensity of the event, so you know how close were you? Did you directly witness or experience it? And then we also have to look at kind of what, what backpack is the student coming with? Um, is the student coming into this um, situation with a backpack full of resiliency variables and support systems and healthy coping? Or are they coming into this with a backpack that's pretty empty, which means lots and lots of risk factors um, and possibly trauma histories, which um, mental health histories, which then lead them open to more vulnerability. The goal is that, you know, we want to provide supports for some of those initial reactions that are to be expected. Um, so after students have been exposed to a trauma, you do expect to see some common reactions. What we hope to do though, is that through our interventions, we prevent it from going into more of those long-term durable psychopathological reactions like post-traumatic stress disorder and other associated mental health conditions. So it's real important you know, that we get in there and we evaluate because all of these variables then lead us into what's the appropriate level of support. And what we talk about in the prepare workshop too, is the importance of universally, we want those support systems to really be activated. So this is where positive school climates come into play. All the prevention programming comes in because if we've built all of those things on the front end, those serve as protective factors. So they're less likely to have long-term traumatic reactions when they have these healthy support systems and these healthy school and family climates for which um, for which they are you know, living. So at the universal level, we're always looking at how can we activate natural support systems. For some students, natural support systems are gonna be enough. They may not need, we're the stepping back and more facilitating those natural supports. But for those students who do need more, we have a whole category of interventions that we re refer to as psycho -ed. And this is really empowering survivors, caregivers, and teachers that, that yes, even though you've been exposed to this type of, of you know, crisis event, it doesn't have to define who you are for the rest of your life. And so through our interventions, we are educating them in regards to what they might experience. We don't ever wanna tell a student, you will experience this kind of reaction, but it's more, this is what you might experience. These are common, these are more atypical, and these are when you really need to get help for yourself or get help for a friend. And then we teach some coping strategies. Um, schools, if they're already doing some things like mindfulness and some of those kinds of interventions, 
they fit right in here because you can really reinforce some of those skill sets that you have been teaching them in regards to emotional regulation skills, problem solving skills, um, social skills, all of those things you can weave into the various levels of intervention. And so under psychoed, it really is more about educating them about what to expect and providing them with some coping strategies. Um, and we do this through informational documents, caregiver trainings, classroom meetings, um, and student psychoeducational groups. And I have slides in a little bit that go more in called psychological interventions. And this is more what we call processing oriented. So these are for the students more impacted who really do need to process and essentially share their trauma narrative, um, share their stories. So this is a much more selected group of individuals usually of the direct emotional connection to the event. And we provide them either in a group or there is an individual process, ways for which they share a narrative and then we work through we work through that and provide coping strategies and, and supports. And then there's also those students, we have to be realistic, whose needs may be beyond what we can provide in a school setting. And we're gonna be looking at referring them out to high quality trauma-informed care resources that we have in the community when it exceeds what we can do in schools. So I always joke when I do these workshops, everything in education has a triangle these days, so disprepare. And so you can see where there's those universal tier one interventions and then we, we they become more directive and more intensive based upon need, based upon your triage um, that you provide students as needed. So I like to look at this kind of, I like to use the LRE kind of analogy that we do for special education. It's very similar in the crisis work. You always want to do an assessment first to determine what exactly is the impact and what do they need, then we always wanna start with the least restrictive crisis intervention, but be ready to provide more directive interventions if needed. Um, so these slides here just kind of show, um, you know, when we talk about reestablishing social supports, these are the different ways that we do that is, you know, reuniting with caregivers, friends, teachers, getting them back to a familiar routine for that sense of safety and security and really facilitations and communities. Are they involved in, you know, a sport, boys and girls club, Boy Scout, Girl Scouts, um, you know, uh, a youth group, you know, really facilitating some of those connections and then really making sure that the adults in their lives are empowered with the knowledge needed in order to help their child or their student um, recover. And then when we talk about psychoeducation, this gets a little bit more directive. And again, as I mentioned, this is designed to provide them with knowledge needed on what they might experience, what is very common and to be expected versus what are some of those symptoms they may have where you need to, to come to an adult for help. And then under psychoeducation, we also are really wanting to make sure we disseminate the facts because we know that rumors can actually be more traumatizing than the facts. So that is a huge piece of all of our interventions. And then we actually teach you how to do a real brief classroom meeting, which is basically time to share the facts as we know them, a lot of it, to be honest with you, is to buy ourselves a little time to figure out exactly what level of supports are we going to need and to let them know that help will be available. Um, then we go a little bit more intensive. The student psychoed group can last anywhere from about 40 age of the kids where we're really um, educating them about some of those reactions and teaching them some stress management and some coping strategies and letting them know where they go for help. So as you can see, this process has a very specific protocol to follow. And so we teach this within the workshop to curriculum. And then when we talk, and then we also have an intervention of how to educate the teachers and the parents. I like to refer to this as the staff meeting and the parent meeting. And so we have a specific process that's followed to make sure are very organized meetings and we get them the, the information they need on how to help the students with the secondary goal of how they can also help themselves as adult caregivers. And so you look at here's the process that goes and, um, and again for parents you might only be doing these with one classroom, you might be doing them with an entire grade level or in a larger scale event, you might be doing these with um, with your entire school community. But that is something that the crisis team would decide on if, 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 if it's needed and who would be getting that. 
Um, and then we get into the psychological interventions and these are more of where they're processing and sharing their trauma narrative. And we have a group process where they're actively exploring. And this process is really to help students feel more connected and normalize their reactions and their experiences. We also use it as a triage tool. Were there some students that need some additional supports that maybe we missed because we weren't aware of um, within our first round of interventions? Um, and then being aware of the fact that, you know, this particular process is much more intensive. They're sharing um, some trauma stories, which um, obviously can be difficult to listen to, but we're, but we're letting them do that in a very safe place. Because what I've discovered is for students that have more of the direct exposure or they're the closest group of friends, they're talking about this anyway. But a lot of times they're doing it in the hallways or they're doing it, you know, at home in somebody's home where there's no adults around. And then they have all these emotions and potentially anxieties and fears that they don't know what to do. So this really provides them a safe place to be able to talk through what they've experienced. And then we teach coping strategies and really look at getting them linked up with the appropriate levels of supports. Or for some students where maybe this is enough, we can exit them back to their natural support systems and we more informally monitor. And then we do have an individual intervention where there's the protocol here where, you know, how we work with individual students who need our supports. Um, and so we have a specific pro process of how to do individual crisis intervention. And so you can see what this protocol looks like. And again, we directly teach the skill set. And then, as I mentioned, you know, we talk about the importance of examining the effectiveness of the work that we do and making sure that early on we do a needs assessment. Again, what do we have in place that's working um, and what do we need to improve on? The process analysis is when an event happens, did you do what you were supposed to do and execute your protocols well? And if not, what didn't work and what do we need to refine or enhance? And then we talk about the importance of doing outcome evaluations, which is, you know, hopefully if you do really good crisis interventions and supports in the aftermath, you're actually to some extent, you know, building some resiliency and some protective factors for the next time they're exposed to some sort of a stressful situation. So at minimum, we want to get our school back to baseline functioning, at least as good as it was before the event. But optimally, I've actually had, you know, seen schools function better because of the supports that, that the students received, really helped them feel much more connected and, and brought some additional resources. So, you know, here's just some program evaluation data, you know, that talks about, um, you know, uh, the effectiveness of the prepare training for anyone who might want to receive some additional training. And then these are just, you know, some important quotes that we've had from school districts that have adopted prepare kind of as their framework and just the importance of the skill set that it has provided. And I have to say, you know, even someone who has helped respond to a variety of different crisis situations including Columbine early on. Um, I was a first year school psychologist when I was asked to help respond to Columbine. I honestly didn't know what I was doing. Um, and I have a master's degree in counseling psychology and felt so my skill set was so overwhelmed. And so what prepare has done, even for those of us that have a lot more experience is it has provided a really good structure for how to not only prevent and prepare, and get really good plans and teams in place, but then a really nice. We're having a little trouble with our audio. I think you cut out there for a minute. Dr. Reeves? Did we lose her? <laughs> oh no. Oh. Um. <laughs> um. Oops. Okay. Maybe she's going to log out. Our best fix for audio issues is to log out and log in. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Getting little bits and pieces. Yeah. But yeah, if you can hear us, um, X out and, and use the link to get back in. We'll try that. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, we're not very technologically um, <laughs> sound yeah, here. She heard us. Yeah. yeah, she heard us. Hey. Awesome. Hey. <laughs> oh, good. That's much better. Okay. 
Um, all right. Um, and so then just real quickly, I want to show this last slide. So, um, you know, and I'd be happy for anyone, you know, to, to email me to get a copy of the PowerPoint or, as I like to say, just take, you know, a quick picture with your phone. But here is a link to some great resources. And there is actually a book on the prepare model that NASP publishes in case anyone would like some additional information um, on prepare. And then I've also given some additional references. Um, you know, again, the prepare webpage, the NASP webpage that are here. And here is my contact information. So what I can do now is open it up for questions because I've done a lot of talking. <laughs> Wonderful. That was also great and, yeah. and helpful. And my, my question as you were just wrapping up is uh, more on the prevention end about school <clears throat> culture. Do you have some favorite school culture assessment tools that you like to, to um, try to figure out how, how a school is doing? Um, oh gosh, favorite ones. Um, I actually, well, for bullying prevention stuff, I actually have a document that I don't know the name of it offhand, um, in my resources that I could provide that does take a look at kind of how to assess for over, how to ask general questions for overall school climate and culture. Okay. Um, I know the search Institute has some guidelines to follow. Um, I don't have really a favorite one that I can list right off the top of my head because I'll be honest with you, every school is so different and so unique mm -hmm. that you really kind of need to take a look at your setting and take a look at some resources that are out there and figure out which one is best going to meet your needs. Sure. But what's real important is whenever you assess school climate and culture, you need to get the perspectives of the students, the staff, and the parents because it's amazing how they don't always line up. Um, and also be asking about physical and psychological safety and also to be asking about when they're on the bus, when they're walking, when they're at after school activities. It's more than just in the classroom and in the hallways. Great point. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, and I think the positive behavior supports a lot of that work also has some, um, some overall general measures that you can do. And I also know that school districts if they have a research and evaluation kind of department, have actually developed their own, um, you know, school climate surveys, and right. then students actually do it through um, Survey Monkey and you know those types of things. And yeah. they give the students ten minutes in class period, and the teachers take them to the um, the computer lab, or a lot of them have iPads and stuff now, or tablets, and they have them do it that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how would you do that once a year, or couple times a year, what do you think? I found a lot of that depends on resources, to be honest with you. Um, the beauty if you do it at, in the fall and in the spring mm -hmm. is you can measure growth primarily with the same population of students you have. Yeah. Um, in students that have a high mobility rate, if you only do it once a year or every two years and say your mobility rate's 30, kind of not measuring, you know, with the same, it, you can compare apples to oranges sometimes. Um, but ideally, fall and spring would be awesome, um, but at least once a year. But I know resources, some schools just do it every other year. Gotcha. I do have a question. You mentioned Survey Monkey, and I had had um, the thought maybe a year or two ago of, you know, let me use, because I, I love Google, let me use a Google form to um, like survey the whole school for like a climate survey or to get kind of some school norms on anxiety, depression, and some of those type of things. Because with Google, you know, it'll put it into a spreadsheet and you could actually, you know, figure out the bottom kind of 10% and maybe intervene. And when I brought that up with my district, there was hesitancy with that because they felt that um, then you're obligated to intervene in some manner and like if some people are filling it out anonymously then they didn't know what to do and they were they were worried about kind of legal ramifications of that do you have any thoughts on that yeah uh, it's well and here's the thing there's not clear case law one way or the other and there's legitimate concerns on both sides um one is is it kind of negligent not to be surveying your students and figuring out where they are to give you a better sense as to where you need to go um with your you know comprehensive school safety planning the flip side of it is if you do ask those questions and you identify students in need yeah we do at least minimally have an ethical obligation to help those students so what some schools have done is they've done the surveys anonymously so that way they're not 
obligated to follow up with, say, in a larger school, 200 kids that maybe came forward as raising concerns. And oh my gosh, there's no way we have enough resources to do that. But if they do it anonymously, they can get kind of a good pulse as to where their building is and where they need to invest in potential prevention programming or support programming. But the case law is not real clear. I've seen district lawyers interpret it on both ends of the spectrum. So yeah, but I always kind of look at, you know, what do we need to do to meet the needs of our kids? What information do we need? And to me, that should always drive practice. Absolutely. All right, um, I think we're gonna take last questions if anybody has anything. It's been kind of a quiet audience tonight. Um, and while we're waiting for anything to come in, um, I wanted to remind people too that um, our next podcast is on the 16th at 2 p.m., so a little bit of a different time with Dr. Reynolds. So um, we're excited for that. But um, yeah, thank you so much for coming. I mean, I, I feel like the topic is so overwhelming and so kind of big and scary, but it's so important, so. Yes, and just to know that find team members who are willing to be as passionate as we are mm -hmm. and develop a team to really move this together. So you have people to work with. And the bottom line is you have to ask to be at the table. Many places still see us primarily as testers. Mm -hmm. And we have to let them know that we have a skill set um, and, and what we have to offer and to ask to be at the table. Or I've also seen in a few places they just showed up and said, oh, well, I thought I was invited. <laughs> and we ended up getting at the table kind of playing more of the naive approach. <laughs> um, so anyway, yeah. So be creative, but also put yourself out there because we've got a great skill set for this area. Good advice. And such good timing for this topic because tomorrow is World Suicide Prevention Day. So hopefully we'll continue to think about all of the resources you've provided and um, figure out ways to advocate for our role and our skills to be a positive um, influence, a positive force in our schools. Thank you so much, Dr. Reed. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Good night, everybody. Yeah.